All right, now that I reviewed all 10 movies, it's time to stop and rank all 10 movies in this. And it, it, this is very interesting. None of these movies are terrible to me. I like all 10. The lowest film on this is a middle of the road. So it's not even terrible, to be honest. So number 10 is the middle of the road movie, Little Monsters. I liked this movie. I just think that it's like Howie Mandel was trying way too much. And it just, it feels really strange. And not in a so bad as good way, just a strange way. It came out in the 80s. Um, 1989, and, uh, yeah, one thing I didn't, forgot to mention in my review is Fred Savage. He never sounds like he's a kid. He sounds like a tiny businessman, the way he talks. Like, he's Joe Pesci, but a PG Joe Pesci, where he's just mouthing off to everyone. Uh, the most fascinating thing about this movie is the casting, where you have... Buzz from Home Alone, but also Daniel Stern. But then Daniel Stern, who is Kevin, the old, did the narration for Kevin in Wonder Years. And then you have Fred Savage, who was Kevin in Wonder Years, so it's all really weird. Uh, Howie Mandel is also, he's fine, but he does get annoying at some points. Who got it, need it, got it, need it, got it, need it, got it, need it. Ho, 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 ho. And the whole plot with if humans are, you know, stay too long or have too much exposure to the monster world, they become monsters. But they didn't have the budget to actually turn them into monsters, so it doesn't really make any sense to me why they have that in there. It just doesn't that doesn't work, which is why it's the middle of the road for me. That part makes it middle of the road. But it's it's alright. Now the next one. Seven of these are pretty good, so Number nine is The Great Outdoors. I enjoyed this film. Um, it just, it's not going to be one of my favorite 80s comedies by any means. Like, going into this, only thing I remember was The Bear. Uh, but you got John Candy. You got Dan Aykroyd. They're fantastic together in this. Uh, it's directed by Howard Deutsch, who, you know, is a fantastic director. And there's some good comedy moments. But, like I mentioned... Uh, what was the name? Buck's romance really doesn't make any sense. It was like it's just thrown in there, and uh, it just seems like the turnaround at the end with where he just he's like, Oh, uh, I was scamming you, and uh, I came out here because we're broke, and then they're just okay, and they're gonna end up living together. Maybe the same person, well, I don't know. But yeah, that's just what kind of puts it down a little bit. Number eight is Blade Runner. And I actually kind of... I was I was more into this than I thought it was going to be. Um, the question of is he a replicated, uh, replicant or not doesn't really matter to me. Uh, Harrison Ford has a good performance, but he does not have any chemistry with Sean Young. And that shows you have a great villain... Uh, great special effects. It's really Scott. It's all really good. Number seven is Coming to America. Now, I spent half of my review talking about the sequel that I hadn't watched, but I read part of it and figured out the ending. No spoilers here, but uh, spoilers in that video. Um, I think this is a fantastic comedy. One of Eddie Murphy's best up there with... Um, Beverly Hills Cop, which I haven't have seen in a very long time. But I remember it being really good. And 48 Hours, which is the one I'd recommend. You want an Eddie Murphy movie? 48 Hours, that's the one uh, I recommend. But this is really good. The fact that he has to put on an accent for the entire time. And everything is just fantastic. Where it boggles down for me is, like, it's very predictable where it's going to go. Like, oh... Okay, yeah, he's going to end up with this girl, even though everything's pushing him away. And how we, all of a sudden, she's just there. There's no, like, scene where she's apologized to. She's just there. Like, we could have had a scene of James Earl, Jones, of James Earl Jones apologizing for what he's done. We don't get that. She's just 
under the veil, and it's very obvious that it's her, but good movie. All right, number six is the batshit insanity that is better off dead, and, uh, huh. this almost, this was almost so bad it's good, but I just say it's pretty dang good because, I mean, it's got talent. John Cusack is fantastic. The dad, um, David Ogden Stiers, he's good. There are some running gags in this. And I was going back and forth between this and the next one. And what made this lower for me, or, yeah, lower, is the running gag with the kid and the $2. Where's my $2? It was annoying. It wasn't funny. After the first time, I was done with it. I'm like, why do we keep seeing this? Why does this keep happening? It's not funny. But the cheeseburger scene, where it's dancing and singing to everybody wants somebody and Halen, that's just fantastic. Number five is Fatal Attraction. And this was a fantastic movie. Uh, clearly, these next three are all top-tier bidet goods, I would say. Um, this was fantastic. The performance in this are great from Michael Douglas to Glenn Close to, you know, even, you know, it's fantastic. However, why it's not higher than this is that it's my first watch. I enjoyed it, but there's some gaps in logic. Like, he goes to the police but he doesn't say it's his problem. He says it's a client's problem. Why doesn't he just say it's him? And I get he doesn't want to tell them that he had the affair. And they never actually clarify whether she was actually pregnant or not. I know she says she's pregnant. I know that he says she's pregnant. But he also says, but I'm not sure. Because you can't be sure. My opinion is she's not, but they never actually clarify it. And my thought process is he actually believes she's not. Because whether or not he's threatening his wife, if she was pregnant, he wouldn't have been able to make that show. Especially if it's his child. If he actually believes she was pregnant. Now whether she is or not, to me, we don't know. But he believes she's, she's not and so do I. So... Number four is Clash of the Titans. A fantastic film. And basically, the only thing that boggles this down to number four is the special effects. Like I said, the stop motion stuff, not bad. But when you put that with the green screens, yeesh. No, it looks terrible. Uh, but everything else is pretty good. I actually really enjoyed this film. The green screens, the special effects, green screen stuff is what made this just a pretty good. Otherwise, it wasn't perfect, but yeah. This was all almost perfect, but... The Wraith is number three, and I was just amazed at how much I really liked this movie. Because it was just, I bought this because I'm trying to get, anything, anytime Vestron pops up at Walmart, I'm going to buy it. So that's why I bought it. That and Sundown Vampire Retreat, which I was the only one left to have to review from the Vestron. Uh, I bought Little Monsters because I wanted to see that. and I bought, But I also bought Shivers. This and this is Sundown Vampire Retreat because you know they're all the same, so I want to kind of collect them. Uh, but this this is a fantastic film, it was almost perfect. The only problem I have besides the ending, where like he implicates his brother as the one who killed them all, that's a big problem for me. That's just like, no, you just framed your brother, and it's cool you want to give him your car, but you just framed him, right? Right. That's my biggest problem, and which is why this is up so high. Is that's the only problem I have that I can't give it a perfect because that that just bugs me so much. Number two is Dirty Doll and Sing. Uh, yes, I think this movie is perfect. I do have a problem because it kind of just all oh, it. It's not like a problem. Problem. It's more of a nitpick where everything just seems to go bad for Johnny and Baby at the end. Just so we can have him come in and say no one puts baby in the corner and have that dance and say it's not going to bug me. But it's just so much to come so fast. It's really a nitpick because you, you you can just shrug it off to me anyway. But, you know, 
this is a example of a classic 80s film. You think of an 80, some of these, name an 80s movie, this could be one you throw off, throw out. As well as my number one, which is no surprise to anyone, I don't think. Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I love this movie. I give it a perfect score. It's fantastic. It's got vulgarity. It's got sex. It's got tits. It's got drugs. It's got um, pizza and fish and, and funny characters and everything you could want from an 80s comedy right here. It's got, it's got like a smorgasbord of actors that you know from uh, Sean Penn to Judge Reinhold to Phoebe Cates to Eric Edwards to is it Eric Edwards? Anthony Edwards to uh, what's his name? Eric Stoltz. There it is. To Ray Walston. To Nicolas Cage in a one five second cameo. This movie is fantastic and it gets number one. So there you go. I did it. I finished the 90s. I still have some time left in the month. So, hopefully, sometime next week, I can start the 90s. That's it. This is, I finished the 80s. Hopefully, sometime next week, I can start the 90s. I have my DVDs picked out. Uh, I had a whole... I had like two stacks of 80s... Of 90s... Blah, of Two stacks of 90s DVDs movies. And I narrowed it down to five. I figured these were the best five I could pick out of the pile. Uh, and so we'll be looking at those five, which I haven't shown you. But I, you will, you know, you will get the video for that. And then I got to go through my Blu-rays and see what I got. But, yeah, this was fun to watch. To actually, I can put these away now. And uh, to, to see some 80s films I either hadn't seen at all or I haven't seen in a while. So... Yeah, so what are your thoughts on my ranking? Let me know in the comments below. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I've been Scotty, and I'll see you in the next one.